Today, New Zealand is well-being on the cards. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian and New Zealand flavour. Well, there's a budget coming up in New Zealand and according to an article in The Conversation, Finance Minister Grant Robertson's promise of a recovery and a well-being budget is an apt recognition of the current social and economic reality. Even though life feels relatively normal in New Zealand compared with the havoc that COVID-19 continues to wreak internationally, the costs of the policy response and the impact of the pandemic recession have not been shared equally across New Zealand. And while details are still scarce, Robertson has made it clear child well-being will be a key focus of this year's budget. Indeed, it will be a priority for the new implementation unit being established to oversee government-wide delivery of key initiatives. The emphasis on children and their families is well placed. Child poverty levels barely budged in the year prior to the pandemic. Moreover, the first Child and Youth Wellbeing Strategy Annual Report released just last week highlighted the lack of well-being experienced by a large group of children. And we know the pandemic hasn't been kind to families. Their recent research conducted last year showed that families with children, particularly low-income families, were more likely to have lost jobs or income during the nationwide lockdown from March to April 2020 compared with homes without children. And following their lockdown data collection, they then went back to the survey respondents in March this year to see how people were doing a year on from lockdown. And what they found, they said, was predictable but no less striking. Only 45% of those low-income families with children, which means pre-pandemic household incomes of 50,000 New Zealand dollars or less per year, with at least one parent working prior to lockdown, had those same parents still employed and bringing home the same or greater weekly pay one year later. More than 20% of those families had a parent who was employed pre-pandemic but looking for a job in March 2021, while 8% had a working parent drop out of the labour market altogether. A further 26% were still working but bringing in home pay less, either from a wage cut, taking on lower paid job or working fewer hours. And while income loss was still prevalent across the income spectrum, higher income families were far more likely to report all the working parents in the home had either maintained or indeed increased their income. And they were also far less likely to have previously employed parents looking for work. Although New Zealand's pandemic policy response likely saved working mothers from the more severe impacts on women's employment seen internationally, the recovery has been slower for Kiwi mothers, they said. Of those in their sample who were employed prior to the lockdown, only 65% of all mothers and 6% of single mothers reported stable or increased weekly take-home pay a year later. And that compares with 71% of fathers. And close to 20% of single mothers who were working pre-pandemic reported being unemployed and searching for a job one year later, compared with 7.5% of mothers and 4.3% of fathers generally. And 10% of pre-pandemic employed mothers with partners said they were no longer working or looking for work at all. The fact that no single mothers who were employed pre-pandemic were classified as not in the labour force by March 2021 is probably related to their survey's smaller sample size. But the finding is indicative, they say, of the precarious position single mothers hold. Not working is not an option. Economic recovery and the population's well-being go hand in hand, they said. Economic and financial precariousness and stress affect our health and well-being. Parents in their sample who were unemployed a year on from lockdown were two to four times more likely to report feeling depressed, 
throughout the day and much less likely to report positive feelings of enjoyment and happiness. And unsurprisingly, those parents who were employed in March 2021 and had similar or better incomes were less likely to report feeling depressed or worried. Budget 2021, they say, is a chance to recognise and rectify the unequal burden the COVID-19 pandemic has placed on families with children and low-income families specifically. Policies and programmes that redistribute money to low-income families and increase their bottom line will be essential, they said. This should include indexing working for families payments to wage growth and disentangling tax credits from work and benefits. That way, all low-income families will receive the financial support they need. Also essential will be combating those expenses, notably housing and childcare, that eat away at family incomes and make New Zealand one of the least affordable places to live. Policies that support working mothers, such as diversifying shovel-ready state-supported jobs and further shoring up the early childcare sector are essential for helping women back to work. And while low-income working families have experienced a slower economic recovery, it's worse still for those unable to work and relying on welfare. They are unlikely to have a fair shot at joining in the recovery. Indeed, the delay in enacting the expert recommendations for welfare reform prolongs devastating hardship for many children in New Zealand. And when New Zealand went into lockdown, the same rules applied to everyone. But we knew the economic shock wouldn't be distributed equally. Here's hoping, they say, Budget 2021 delivers a recovery that recognises families who sacrificed the most. <laughs> Yet also elsewhere in the conversation, Mark Harvey, a senior lecturer at Creative Arts, University of Auckland, writes it seems unlikely the arts will be a priority in the government's May 20 budget. With housing affordability, climate change and child poverty all urgent issues, arts funding might not be seen as equally important. But he argues it should be for two main reasons. It makes economic sense and it also is essential for our health and well-being in myriad ways. The two are, of course, interrelated. Despite the wider arts sector accounting for up to 7% of the total workforce, it receives a disproportionately small proportion of overall government spending, he said. Last year, arts, culture and heritage were given just 0.33% of the total 2020 budget and COVID-19 recovery package of 374 million New Zealand dollars out of 112.1 billion New Zealand dollars. This was an increase on previous years, but is still minuscule compared to other sectors. And yet, the performing arts alone contributed $2.3 billion to the economy back in 2018. According to the Ministry of Culture and Heritage, the sector matched or outpaced other sectors of the economy in terms of income, employment and value added. And furthermore, New Zealanders participate in cultural activities at least as much as in sports and other recreations. For Maori, Arts and culture overshadow sports and other leisure activities. And it's not that the government doesn't acknowledge the role of the arts in the nation's health and well-being. Prime Minister and Associate Minister for Arts Jacinda Ardin has spoken and written publicly about this on several occasions. The government has also used temporary support packages to help art organisations and professionals through the pandemic. However, there has been no significant long-term funding increases for arts practitioners nor for arts education. And most COVID grants are limited to building commercial capacity. So the question is what to do? The government needs to consult with practitioners, researchers and experts, he says, across all genres of art, practice to determine how and where to invest for the best returns and how to build a sustainable life as an artist. And finally, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand released their latest residential mortgage statistics to March 2021 and it tells a pretty horrid story. It shows that debt to income ratios of home buyers are continuing to go nuclear, especially in Auckland. March, of course, was a record for total mortgage borrowing through the country with a mega $10.4 billion borrowed. In summary, big loans at high income multiples. Auckland's first home buyers in March collectively borrowed around $815 million. The high debt to income mortgages for first home buyers in Auckland in the same period amounted to 
on average $750,000 and based on 734 loans that totaled $552 million. And remember the average Auckland price for property is now north of $1 million. But it's worth noting that the owner occupiers in Auckland weren't actually that far behind. They borrowed $1.833 billion in March, of which $1.11 billion or 60.6% was at debt to income ratios of above 5, which begs the question, should the new DTI limits which are coming also be applied to first time buyers for the sake of financial stability and possibly borrower sanity? Mortgage lending is a right royal mess in New Zealand as well as in Australia and actually few want to lean against it because of course they need the growth and wealth effect. But if in fact the real objective of a budget is to create more well-being for people, then we need to think differently about what levers to pull and how to pull them. And it could be, maybe, that we will see New Zealand leading the way on the 20th, or maybe not. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.